glory of the Lord forever be our joy. May redemption be the theme of our song. For by grace we have been saved, and by grace we shall proclaim to the corners of the earth that Christ is come. goes forth in the Holy Spirit's power with the glories of the gospel to exclaim. Now we pray your kingdom come and we pray your will be done for the honor and the glory of your name. Let the nations be glad, let the peace salvation belongs to our God. Let the whole earth be filled with the praises of the Lord, for salvation belongs to our God. Let the nations be glad, let the people rejoice, for salvation Welcome, good morning. On this fine Sunday morning, we get to gather together as God's people and worship Him. Just a couple announcements as we begin our morning together. Uh, First is, um, all the important communication from the church to you is coming through email. So if you do not, if you're not receiving the church's emails, you should email into office at fortwilliambaptistchurch.com so you're getting these updates. Um... And along with that, each week, Claire from the office sends out a weekly roster, and it's really helpful for the planning of the weekend services that you um, alert her if you're not coming or if you're going to bring a visitor or a friend. It helps for planning. And last uh, announcement is giving. And so we're not passing the plate as we have usually done. There's a box in the back as you come in or on your way out, and uh, you can give on our website, and all the information is there, fortwilliambaptistchurch.com. And so we gather to worship the Lord, and the call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 148. So listen 
to what the psalmist says. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For He commanded and they were created, and He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling His word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above heaven and earth. He raised up a horn for his people, praised for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so the truth rings out from Psalm 148. There is one God. And as we think about created reality from the most glorious of beings, you think about in the heavens, there are the angels. So we think about the the most glorious beings down to the most lowly beings, livestock who walk around in fields chewing grass. Everything from these angels to cows are created to worship and glorify God. God. And as we consider Psalm 148 for ourselves, it is our most sacred duty, our most sacred calling to rise up and glorify our great God. The psalmist tells us, praise the Lord. So that's what we get to do this morning. So would you stand up and with loud voice and with a glad heart, praise the Lord. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh praise Him, alleluia, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam.
return in power to reign. Heaven and earth will join to sing. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Then who shall fall on bended knee? All creatures of our God and King. my 
what we get to do now as God's people, praying together to the Lord with one heart and one voice is a blood-bought privilege. Listen to what the author of Hebrews says. Brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So let's draw near to our God this morning. Almighty God, from beginning to end, your word declares the truth. You are the only God. And you have spoken to us, saying, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and set it before me. And as we consider these words from Isaiah, Father, we say to you that no answer can be given. You are the only God. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are the sovereign king who brings all things to pass by your word. You alone are God, and that is our confession. But as we stare at this clear and plain truth that you are the only God, your word judges us. For we, like all people, have turned away from what was clear and plain. We stopped worshiping you and instead worship the things you created. We worship rocks and trees and animals and men. And the clearer the truth was, the greater our shame. And so as your people, we come to you with humility this morning. And we say with David, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And so, Father, we do realize we have much reason for humility. We turned away from the clear and plain truth that you are the only God. And while we have much reason for humility as we gaze upon our sin, our folly, we have much reason for joy, for you are the only God, and you have proclaimed the great news in our ears. You have said, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, your Savior. Even more, you have spoken words of love into our hearts. You have said to us, I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. And so we rejoice because, Father, your love is so great. Your mercy is so unexpected. And your faithfulness to us is so precious. It's all undeserved. And your words gladden our hearts this morning. And it is our joy to praise you and adore you. For you are the only God, the Savior, our rock. And so we come to you this morning as your people. We come to you in light of your love and your mercy and your faithfulness. All of these things you revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We come to you and we ask for help in our time of need. We ask specifically this morning that you would lead us in the path of pure worship. That we would be a people who put to death all idolatry. That we would not lean upon anything for help or comfort or satisfaction, but you. That you would be our only salvation and that we would look for salvation in your name. Father, we ask that you would give us awareness to see the gods of the nations and how they are at work. That you would make us as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That we would not fall into the trap of idolatry that we would not fall into the trap of false worship. And so we pray, would you give us discerning minds and hearts that we would understand what's going on around us. And we ask that you would fuel worship in our lives, that we would be worshipers of you at home with our families, that we'd be worshipers of you in private by ourselves, that we'd be worshipers of you in the public place, and that we'd be worshipers of you even here now. We ask that you would turn our hearts to you, that you would again show us your glory and your beauty so that we would rise up and confess the truth about you with glad hearts. And Father, we ask 
we ask that true worship would spread abroad. Oh, Father, we desire to see true worship grow in this city. We want to see people cast down their idols and turn to you, the living God. We want to see people wait for the Son of God who will be revealed from the heavens. Oh, Father, we pray that pure worship would grow in this country and around the globe. We long to see all of humanity rise up and sing your praises. And so we come this morning asking that you would work your purposes of redemption. And so, Father, we give our attention to your word this morning. We have come this morning to hear you speak and to do business with our hearts. And so, Father, as we listen to your word this morning, we ask that you would do spiritual surgery that you would awaken to us, that you would awaken us to see the truth, that you would show us our duty as the redeemed of God. So would you speak to us now, we pray in your son's name, amen. So friends, brothers and sisters, um, we're starting a new series on the Ten Commandments, so if you have your Bibles, you can take them and open up to the book of Exodus. We're going to be in chapter 20. And our sermon text this morning is verses 1 through 3. So we're going to be looking at the first word, the first commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. So let's give ourselves to God's word. Starting in verse 1, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Oh, Father, would you bless the reading and the preaching of your word now? So every story has a backstory, and we'll begin by considering the often untold or overlooked backstory of the first commandment. And so for some reason or another, as I grew up, as I grew up, whether it was the children's Bibles that I had read or my own faulty thinking or the VeggieTale movies that I had watched, Mo and the Big Rescue, I grew up thinking that while the Israelites were in the land of Egypt, enslaved there, they were a supremely pious people a people who diligently sought the face of the Lord, a people who kept pure worship, a people who were righteous and and blameless. So I had this, this mental picture of the people of God, Israel, in Egypt, but I had my bubble burst when I came across two passages of Scripture. And the first passage that changed my mind comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 14. And so here in the book of Joshua, Joshua, the successor of Moses, is at the end of his life and he looks to Israel gathered before him and he gives them this this sermon. And this is what he says. He says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. That's not very hard to understand. He's calling Israel, you need to worship the Lord alone. But then he says this, put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. What is Joshua saying? He's making clear here as he speaks to Israel that these people have had a long history with idol worship. And what we can make sense of Joshua's exhortation is that while the descendants of Abraham were in Egypt and they multiplied there for 400 years, they were contaminated by Egyptian worship and idolatry. They weren't a pure people. And the second passage that changed my thinking was Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 5 through 8. And so in this passage, the eccentric prophet does a bit of spirit-inspired revisionist history. And so you won't find this particular retelling of Israel's history anywhere else in the Old Testament. And so we're used to the scriptures telling us that Israel rebelled in the wilderness, grumbling about a lack of water or a lack of food or something that just didn't sit right with him. But what Ezekiel tells us is that Israel rebelled when they were in the land of Egypt. That's surprising. Listen to what Ezekiel says. 
He says, Thus says the Lord God, On the day when I chose Israel, I swore to the offspring of the house of Jacob, making myself known to them in the land of Egypt. He phrased. I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. And on that day I swore to them that I would bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most glorious of all lands. And I said to them, Cast away the detestable things your eyes feast on, every one of you, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Then Ezekiel says this, But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. None of them cast away the detestable things their eyes feasted on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. And so with colorful language, Ezekiel the prophet comes to us and he reveals the heart condition of Israel. Israel wasn't flirting with idolatry, just picking a few appetizers off the menu and nibbling away at them. No, Ezekiel tells us that Israel feasted upon the idols in Egypt. And so we get this mental image of Israel in the banquet hall of worship, sitting down at the table of the false gods and gorging themselves to the brim, filling their stomachs up, leaving no room for any dessert. And so as we consider what Joshua says in chapter 24 and what Ezekiel says in chapter 20 of his book, we see that the people God redeemed from Egypt and who gathered around Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments had a problem with idolatry. And so that's the backstory of the first commandment. And so we need to ask a very simple question. Why does any of this matter? Why is it important that we know that Israel had a heart for idols when we come to this text? Well, there are two answers to this question. We must consider both of them. So the first answer is this. This backstory of idolatry, Israel's history with idols, explains why the Lord is so apt to remind Israel of what he accomplished in the Exodus. So we read this already. This is our sermon text. Chapter 20, verse 2. The Lord says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is what the Lord says right before he states the first commandment. And in fact, as we think about this backstory of idolatry, the backstory helps us make sense of the whole Exodus story. And we need to think about this. What happens in the Exodus story? Well, the Lord, the God who made the heavens and the earth, the God of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, could have wiped out Pharaoh and all of Egypt with just his words. The Lord could have just said, Israel, be free, and Israel would have been free. But you read the Exodus story, and instead the Lord orchestrates this long, drawn-out process of redemption. And in this process of redemption, we encounter ten plagues, and they're kind of messy. Water turned into blood. Frogs, gnats, flies, hail, among other great signs. And in this process, we listen to this back and forth dialogue, conversation between Moses and Pharaoh. Let the people go. No. Let the people go. No. And even more, the Lord in his wisdom leads Israel to a place where they're trapped. You remember the story, the Red Sea on one side of them and Pharaoh and his host, his chariots on the other. No way to escape. No wiggle room. And as modern readers, as we we deal with the story, the Exodus story, this seems like a a very inefficient way to save a people. Why go to all of that trouble? Why ten plagues when the matter could have been dealt with with one word, Israel, be free? Why put up with Pharaoh and his treachery for so long? We need to see this. The Lord orchestrated the Exodus in this particular way to reveal in dramatic fashion this theological point, the Lord alone is God and there are no others beside him. All these events, the plagues, the way the story is arranged show the emptiness and the vanity of other gods and shout forth the supremacy of Yahweh alone. Or we can say it like this, all the events found in the Exodus story are the flesh and blood demonstration of the truth found in the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And if you carefully listen to the Exodus story, you will find the truth of the first commandment restated again and again. The Lord wants the Egyptians to know the truth of the first commandment. Listen to what the Lord says in Exodus chapter 7, verse 5. 
The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. More importantly, the Lord wants his own people, the covenant children, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to know the truth of the first commandment. Listen to what the Lord says in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. The Lord says, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them. Why? What's the payoff of all this? That you may know that I am the Lord. That you may know that I am the Lord. And as we move through the Exodus story, we find that these great events, the ten plagues, the splitting of the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh and his chariots and his great host, begin to produce right and, right and proper theological confession among the people of God. So we go to Exodus chapter 15. We looked at this song twice last week. And so here in Exodus chapter 15, the the people of God have witnessed the great deeds of the Lord, how he rescued them, and they're by the sea, and they begin to sing to the Lord. And what do they sing to the Lord? Well, they sing the first commandment. Listen to Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? And so this backstory helps us understand what the Lord is doing throughout this whole Exodus story. His intention is to unmask the gods around Israel and show them just how empty and foolish they are. So that's the the, the first answer. There's a second answer. This backstory of idolatry, so thinking about Joshua, thinking about Ezekiel, helps us understand the intention of the first commandment. So as we consider the Exodus story, the truth about God has been proclaimed in the ears of Israel. The truth about God has been set before the eyes of Israel, and Israel has even spoken the truth about God with their mouths. They sang, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? But here with the first commandment, the Lord intends to drive this very truth into their hearts, that there is only one God. We have to understand what the Lord's up to here. For the Lord, it was not enough to just free Israel from the land of Egypt, physically removing them from from this land of darkness, this land of idolatry. We see in the Ten Commandments, the Lord wants more for his people. He wants Israel completely free from idolatry, their hearts. And so we find in this first commandment, the Lord continuing his assault on idolatry as he works to purify his people from all residual leftovers of idolatry. So Gerhard S. Voss, he's this old, dead Bible commentator, he made this comment about the commandment and what it should teach us. And he wrote this. He said, The commandment is a protest against sin. And the very fact that God issues such a protest teaches us that he will not leave sin in possession of the field. You get what Voss is saying. What he says is so precious and so significant. It helps us understand the intention of the Lord. And so we ask, well, what is the intention of the Lord in the first commandment? Well, it's this. He will not leave sin in possession of the fields. We can work away at this. We can try to illustrate this for our minds. And we can think of the the battlefield. So sin, our great enemy, has dug into its position. You can think of the First World War. Sin has dug into its position, making deep trenches in the field, setting up barbed wire and machine guns, lining the field with explosive. And here we are, we gaze at this field, and we say, oh boy, I can never take this field. We're tempted to throw our hands up and surrender. But here in the commandment, the Lord, the great general of the battlefield, comes to us and he speaks these words. If we understand what the Ten Commandments are doing, he says this to us. Do not fear. I will utterly push back the enemy. You can be assured of this, that at the end of the battle, the enemy will not have one square inch of dirt to stand upon. Every enemy will be uprooted and destroyed. I will take possession of that field. I will push them back. Sin will have no dominion 
over my people. And this is so precious as we study these Ten Commandments. And we can be assured of this. Just as the Lord utterly destroyed Pharaoh and his host, he will utterly destroy sin and set his people's hearts free from it. And we can take this to the bank. The Lord will not leave sin in possession of the field. And we have to remember this as we fight our own sin. The Lord is the great general of the battlefield. And as we study these Ten Commandments, we learn his intention. He's going to push it out. And so with the backstory, we get a clear understanding of what God's trying to get done with his people. He wants to free them from false worship. He wants to push back sin. And so we have the backstory of the first commandment. And with the backstory, we, we learn the Lord's intentions, and we've been going behind the first commandment, but, but, but now we need to look at the first commandment for itself. So you shall have no other gods before me. What does this commandment mean? Well, the commandment proclaims the truth about God. What's the truth about God? He is the only God. And the commandment also proclaims the duty required of God's people. You shall only worship the Lord, exclusive worship of Yahweh. So we can turn our attention to the practical, and this might be the most helpful way to proceed. So we've heard these words from the mouth of God, you shall have no other gods before me. And we have to ask, well, what did that mean for God's people? We can think about this in concrete terms. What did God expect from Bob and Sally and family from the tribe of Dan? What would it have looked like for Bob and Sally and family from the tribe of Dan to worship God exclusively? So we need to think about this. And as we think about it, there's no single answer we can give. For the first commandment is comprehensive. This means that in order to obey the first commandment, one has to subject and surrender every single part of their life to it. The first commandment is not simply the matter of passing a, a theological exam. I can speak the truth about God. It's a matter of subjecting one's entire existence to the true God. And so if you take the time and you pace through your Old Testament, you'll quickly find just how comprehensive the first commandment was for Israel. It dealt with every part of their existence. And it's fruitful for us to consider how comprehensive the first commandment was. And so we can think about The body. So as we think about Bob, Sally, and family, we can think about their bodies and how the commandment applied. It applied to their mouths. The commandment, the first commandment, regulated how they would talk. Listen to Exodus chapter 23, verse 13. Pay attention to all I have said to you, and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. So we listen to this text and we learn that there's not even to be a whisper of the other gods in the congregation of Israel. You don't talk about them. Also, we can say positively that Israel to use their mouths to instruct people in the pure worship of God. So you don't talk about the other gods. Rather, you talk about Yahweh and his righteous rules. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. We can also think about our ears. So not only was Israel not to speak about the other gods, but they were not to listen to anyone who was speaking about them. And so you would not give your ears to the false gods. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 6 through 8. If your brother, the son of your mother, or the son of your daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your friend, who is as your own soul entices you secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known. Some of the gods of the peoples who are around you, whether near you or far off from you, from the one end of the earth to the other, you shall not yield to him or listen to him. We can think about our hands. So you don't speak about the other gods, and you don't listen to enticing reports about the other gods. Even more, you must make war with the other gods. With your very hands, Israel was required to dash to pieces and purge the land from false worship. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 2 and 4. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods. 
on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash them in pieces and burn their ashram with fire. You shall chop down their carved images of their gods and destroy the name of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. So the mouth, the ears, the hands, grab an axe, smash idols. And think about your bed. The commandment teaches who you should or shouldn't take to be your husband or your wife. The commandment regulates the very matter of romance and sexual intimacy. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. You shall not intermarry with them. Speaking about the nations in the land of Canaan, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they will turn turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. And so we see this commandment is comprehensive. One must literally subject their bodies, so your mouth, your ears, your hands, your sexual organs, to the Lord. But we have to understand that this is not the whole matter or even the most important matter of the first commandment. The commandment must not only be applied to our physical bodies, but to the interior of our person. And so the commandment applies to the life of the mind. Israel was to discern the utter vanity of idols. They were to think this through. Idols are just rocks and stones and trees. They cannot speak. They cannot move. They cannot save. They cannot hear. The gods of the nations are nothing. Listen to what Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, what it it says. You got to love the prophets because they mock the other gods. Jeremiah says, their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. And they cannot speak. They have to be carried for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil. Neither is it in them to do good. So the first commandment applies to the life of the mind. It also applies to the emotions. Fear, anxiety, worry. Israel was to run to the Lord and the Lord alone. Listen to Psalm 146 verses 3 and 4 as it deals with the emotions of Israel. The psalmist says, Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. So the mind, the emotions, and last of all, the affections. The affections, that inner disposition that controls what you delight in, what you seek, what you orient your life towards, what you ultimately love. Listen to what Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 says. This is what it means to keep the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So we look at the first commandment. It's only eight simple words. You shall have no other gods before me. But as we study this first commandment, it touches and it transforms every single part of life, your physical body, the interior of your person. And as we think about Israel and their backstory of idolatry, they desperately needed this word from the Lord. They needed idolatry purged from their midst. They needed to be instructed in the pure worship of the Lord. And the truth is the same for us. We need this very word. We need the first commandment. And we can ask why. Because our story resembles Israel's story. All of us, every single one of us, were at one time idolaters. Just like Israel came to the banquet halls of idolatry and sat down and gorged their stomachs, we did the same thing. We filled to the brim our our bellies with the gods of the nations. We yearned for comfort and for success and admiration and pleasure. And so we gave ourselves to sundry idols, hoping that they would come through for us and save us, hoping that they would bring to us lasting satisfaction. Some of us gave ourselves to blatant wickedness, sexual morality, drunkenness. Some of us turned good gifts into idols, careers, spouses, children, sports, recreation, stuff. Our story is just like Israel's. We have a sordid backstory. But the good news is that when we were feasting in the banquet halls of idolatry, God in Christ saved us. 
Just like the Lord came and saved Israel from the banquet halls of idolatry and drew them out of that dark land, the Lord drew near to us and he delivered us once and for all out of the domain of darkness and he forever planted us in the kingdom of the beloved Son, a kingdom of righteousness and light. But here's the sad truth. We are like Israel. Israel was redeemed, but the gods of the nation still stuck to them. And if we're honest with ourselves, we find the gods of the nation still sticking to us. We find ourselves looking for comfort or success or admiration or pleasure, and we catch ourselves bending down to the futile idols, thinking that they're going to save us or that they're going to come through for us. We just like Israel, gathered at Sinai, listening to these words, we just like them need our hearts purged and cleansed and instructed. And so the question for us this morning is, how do we put to use the first commandment in our life? How do we put to use the first commandment in our life? There are four simple directions for us this morning to follow, to obey the first commandment. The first direction is this. You must give yourself to reflection. So give yourself to reflection. This means look at your mouth, your ears, your hands, your bed, your mind, your emotions, your affections. Consider all of these things. In particular, give attention to patterns in your life and question them. This is going to help us understand if we're committing false worship. So we can ask ourselves questions as we look at our hands and as we notice patterns or we look at our ears and and look at patterns. We can ask ourselves, well, why do I pick up my smartphone 40 times a day? There's that thing on iPhones that tells you what you do with your phone. It's kind of scary. Why do I lay in bed sleepless at night replaying that conversation over and over and over again? And this happens several times in a week. Why do I come home at night and I plop myself down on the couch in front of the TV for three to four hours at a time? Why do I drink so much wine? Why am I always at work and never at home with the children? And the questions are endless, but we have to be clear what we're aiming at as we ask these questions and as we consider our hands and our ears and our hearts. Work, smartphones, wine, TV, they're not bad in and of themselves. The point is that these questions allow us to probe the status and the inclinations of our heart. They reveal in very tangible ways where we're looking for comfort or help or salvation. They allow us to see whether we're turning to God or we're turning to someone else or something else. They help us probe our hearts and see if we're keeping the first commandment. And so the first direction is that we have to reflect on our lives. And the second directive builds off of this. We have to confess. And so when we notice, when we notice false worship in our lives, we need to go to God and we need to tell him how we broke the first commandment. It's helpful if we can be as specific as possible, confessing our sin to the Lord. And so here's a couple examples. Father, I I sinned. I broke the first commandment by incessantly checking my bank account. I trust money more than I trust you. Or, Father, I sinned against you. I broke the first commandment. I see clearly from my many sleepless nights that I seek approval from man and not from you. And so we reflect. And when we see sin in our lives, we confess the sin to the Lord. And there's a third directive. After we confess our sin, we ask for help. And this doesn't need to be anything magnificent or or lengthy. You can simply go to the Father and pray something like this. Father, my heart yearns for the approval of my coworkers. Show me the vanity of people pleasing. Remind me of what you have spoken in the gospel. And Father, I'm laying sleepless here tonight. Give me sleep. Give sleep to your beloved. Or Father, my, my heart trusts in riches. I cling to them. Would you please reveal to me the uncertainty of riches, how quickly they mold and rot and decay. Place before me again and again the certainty and the preciousness of your promises. Help me now to trust in the word of the gospel. And so we need to reflect, 
We need to confess. We need to ask for help. And last of all, we need to find in Jesus what our hearts long for. And the truth is this. Jesus is far better than any of the gods of the nations. And so we can work away at this this morning. Do you look for safety today? Do you look for safety? Does your heart crave for it in this time? Well, know the truth of the gospel. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. And know him. His watchful eye is always upon the sheep. He owns your life. He's bought it with his precious blood. Or we can ask, do you look for comfort today? Do you look for comfort? Know that Christ Jesus has the best and most sure promises. He speaks a better word than anything else. He says, lo, I will be with you always unto the end of the age. Or are you weary and tired? Are you looking for a rest? Is that what your heart craves for? Know that all the rest you need in this present life is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Or do you look for happiness? Your heart craves supreme happiness. You're looking for joy and pleasure. Well, you need to know the truth of the gospel. All pleasures are to be found in Christ Jesus himself. Are you looking for beauty or goodness or truth? They're found in Christ. Know this. Glory shines from Jesus' face. And all who look upon the Son with faith Feast upon that glory, that beauty, and enjoy him. We have to understand the importance of this fourth step. It's the most important step. You can analyze your sin. You can confess your sin. You can ask help all day, every day. But if you never apply yourself to this fourth step, you will never never gain victory over your sin. If you never apply yourself to this fourth step, you will never actually keep the first commandments. The only way to keep the first commandment is by careful and constant application to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. How do you keep the first commandment? Well, you go to the Lord Jesus and you find everything in him. And so, brothers and sisters, we just like Israel need this word. We need idolatry. We need false worship purged from our lives. And the Lord reveals his gracious intention He's going to take the field, and so he says to us, calling us to action with him, you shall have no other gods before me. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you for your gracious intentions to drive sin from our hearts. And so we ask that you would make us a people faithful to reflect and give careful consideration to our lives. Our ears, our mouths, our hands, our beds our minds, our emotions, our hearts. And Father, may we be a people who confess our sins to you and ask for help. And even more, may we be a people who run to Jesus Christ. May we be a people who run to Jesus Christ and keep the first commandment by coming to him again and again and again. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Please stand.
God, pour out your grace, glorious grace, that I would be held by your perfect embrace. I am undeserving, you are high and worthy, all of my praise for this glorious grace. The letter of 1 John ends with these words, and they're fitting. John says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So would you receive this benediction now? 
May God, the Almighty God who created heaven and earth, who came down at Sinai and spoke the ten words, and the God who sent the beloved Lord Jesus Christ, may he now work through the preaching of your word. May he work his purposes of redemption, pushing sin out of your life, taking the field. May you experience the great victory of the Lord in your life this week. May you be faithful to analyze your life, to confess your sin, to ask for help, and to find all that you need in Jesus Christ. Would you go in peace and joy? Amen.